Hey guys, it's that evil hack together with Lore Master of Sodek here. Hello. And today we'll tell you about the biggest, motherfucking, giant, huge, oversized monsters of the Warhammer Fantasy universe. Put on your Jeff Goldblum glasses because this will be Jurassic Park for big girls. Let's start with number five, the rogue idol of Gork, or possibly more. Well, I heard it's glued together with dung. What do you say, Sorek? That's not inaccurate. So, rogue idols of Gork, or possibly Mork, are these colossal structures that, essentially, when orcs gather together, they will build effigies to Gork, or possibly Mork, which you see a lot in Total War Warhammer. If you look around the maps, you'll see these giant stone uh, stacks with, like, a big uh, orc face on it. But sometimes, if the green skins are particularly animated or guided by a shaman, or just the energy of the Wa itself, which for those unfamiliar, um, the way that green skins even use magic is when they all get together, they get so amped up on each other's energy that they actually start to manifest this physical power, which sometimes they use as magic, but sometimes it can have other concerning effects. That sounds like opening of a new Walmart. <laughs> yeah, essentially yeah that actually that's a really good it's basically black library at walmart when all of the orcs get together but instead of running over employees and trampling elderly people to death they instead put together these big uh humanoid statues in the shape of their gods and if there's enough orcs together their wa energy will give it a spark of life and it will just animate itself it's not even like a wizard is controlling it or animating it. It gains a form of sentience, and the only sentience it has is to bash and crump the nearest person and just start rampaging. And the orcs love it. They'll literally just follow it around. Now, some of them don't... The average one isn't insanely large. Like, you might expect to see it like being roughly a story to two stories tall. But some of them, known as the Great Idols, are fucking huge these suckers get to the size where they make they make Kolek get a little sweat drop of nervousness because they can just plow through castle walls like they're not even there and the great idols are they get so big that they can easily step on other monsters even to the extent that things like croxgorge or dragons would give them a wide berth lest they get absolutely stomped into the dirt and these things are functionally invincible too one of the only ways to act, because they're just made of stone and wood cobbled together with random, literal, just orc shit and blood and whatever crap the orcs could fashion together in enough time. And the only way to stop this thing is to either completely blow it apart, which is nearly impossible if it's a great idol, or to basically destroy the army around it to the point that their wa energy isn't able to animate it anymore and it will basically collapse into a bunch of stones and stop moving. The only problem with that method is if a strong wind of magic blows through the area or the orcs come back, it will literally, without them needing to do anything, just immediately reassemble itself and begin rampaging again. The only other way to deal with it is for a wizard of the alt of the other race that is dealing with it to essentially bind it under their control. But idols of Gork or possibly Mork are impossible to control unless there's something for them to fight. As long as you can direct them towards a fight, they'll actually gladly do what you want and can even be used against the Greenskins if the orcs aren't careful. But ultimately, they're just big, terrifying juggernauts of uh, destruction. Like, Tomb King Colossi, eat your heart out. The Greenskins got this down. Okay, um, well, essentially, from what you said, the idol is nothing else but a golem. And you guys surely encountered uh, such a creature in any kind of games, most probably RPGs, where big, dumb, and roughly humanoid clay construct is a muscle for some, you know, wimp wizard. But it's not an idea of fantasy writers, because the origins of golems are rooted in Jewish folklore, and it's all about an anthropomorphic entity built from mud or clay or other inanimate matter. But I haven't read about golems made from shit. That would be that would be something. Um, and then magically brought to life. In Talmud, the first man, Adam, 
is basically a golem since he was put together from dust but then he was given all the human attributes which golems don't possess like the ability to speak so rogue idols have a few core characteristics of the mythological golems aside of consisting of stuff like stones rubble and whatnot and being covered in sigils both creatures are built and animated using not exactly magic but more of a religious ritual According to the Jewish tales, a golem could be vivified through an ecstatic state reached with combinations of Hebrew letters forming any of the names of God. And as you just heard, Sodek, rogue idols are put together by green skins shamans, uh, also in a sort of an ecstatic state involving dancing, which itself is one of basic principles of any kind of shamanism. And then all the orcs get hyped and amped about each other. So this is kind of a crowd religious trance i would even say so yeah now you know now you can go dig in mud make your own uh shit shit statue so we're moving to number four the Kemrick titan yes indeed so although i just talked shit about them a second ago it turns out the tomb kings do have a bigger runner in the race <laughs> than most people <laughs> are aware of so the Kemrick titan is the ultimate um essentially craft that the tomb kings ever managed it is the most powerful of their constructs and it is quite literally a colossus now the kimmerick titans are very rare to see because most of them are buried so deep beneath the sands and the winds of magic required to animate them is so insane that they almost never animate and disturb the dunes from which they lie beneath but on the rare occasion that they do wake up the Kimrik Titans are basically a living fortress. These are creatures that are so massive in size that they easily dwarf the other big constructs we're all familiar with, like the Necro Sphinx and the uh, Kimrik Dwarf Sphinx. These things are huge. And worse, instead of making them kind of cool but still creepy, being an actual Sphinx, you know, with a lion's lower body, Instead, we have the Kimriac Titan, which is just a colossal scarab beetle. So it's like the worst thing they could have made into a construct. Yeah, and you, we, we know what scarab beetles are. They are just the dung beetles. Oh, yep. Yeah, these ones are... Uh, the Tomb Kings, unfortunately, didn't seem to be aware of that or didn't care and decided to make this thing absolutely horrifying. So much like other constructs, uh, a Kimriac Titan is powered by the souls of a great warrior of the past but unlike other constructs which tend to have a single individual bound into them Kimriac titans often have entire dynasties of some of the most powerful warrior kings to have ever walked across nehekara basically if their bodies were ruined to the point that they could no longer be properly preserved as tomb kings they would instead plant the entire family into a Kimriac titan and they work as one mind but because of that, they're exceedingly powerful and are drawing from hundreds of years of experience and battle knowledge. To make things worse, these things were decked out with so many curses and so much power by the Lich Priests and the Necrotex that it's nauseating. They have abilities like, if you get into a fight with one, first thing you gotta watch out for are the Reaping Blades, which are their giant forelimbs that can side through just about anything. It can literally cut through a dragon like a butter knife. There are four claws, essentially. Then, if you decide to get up close and personal, and you're like a unit of people, what they'll tend to do is they will vomit on you. But instead of vomiting, I don't know, vomit or blood or something we're used to in Warhammer, they vomit a literal torrent of flesh-eating scarabs that will not stop until they've devoured everything in front of the Titan into nothing but bones. On top of that, they did put in a couple of nasty uh, power-ups on it, something known as the Breath of Night, which is essentially that where some people would face a Titan and find it scary enough, the Lich Priests managed to take the essence of mankind's fear of death and they made it into a weapon. And they called it the Breath of Night. And basically what it is, is that when you face this Kimriac Titan, it exudes this malefic aura that literally forces you to feel that terror of your own mortality. Which is a really shitty, not fair weapon to use in war. 
The last two things that it's really famous for are, of course, it's devouring jaws, which are pretty self-explanatory, and they will just kill you. If, if they get you, you're dead. Like, it doesn't matter if you're a Shaggith or a dragon or a demon prince or whoever. If, if they get you in their jaws, you're, you're dead. Period. End of story. And the last thing, which is its most terrifying power, is called Soul Slaying Hunger, which is that... Um, implanted inside of the Kimriac Titan and what makes it so powerful what makes it so powerful and have the ability to unleash magic which by the way it can cast magic because why not right it basically has the ability to use the desert itself as a weapon but it what powers it is that it has a literal gate to Usirian's realm which is the realm of the underworld for the Nehekarans and what it will do as kind of a last resort weapon is that it will literally rip open this gate to the realm of the dead and it causes a vortex like a tornado that just sucks in everyone who's standing in front of it uh it sucks in their souls so if you were to come upon a battlefield where the kimmeri titan had been you could literally come across an entire army of corpses that don't have a scratch they just died because <laughs> he literally just opens up and absorbs all their souls and basically just cast them to the deepest darkest pits of Usirian's underworld which for those unaware is a horrible place because the dread abyssals which are these giant dog creatures whose innards are made of the souls of the people who they've chowed down on will proceed to chow down on you and of course finally if you do manage to kill a titan unfortunately it has been cursed with so much power that the death curse it unleashes is like the one the tomb king has but on insane levels of steroids if you kill a titan there is a very significant chance that the explosion of magic regardless of how far away you are from it the curse will zero in on you and it will kill you like there's basically no way to destroy this thing without killing yourself in the process and that's assuming you're able to do so when it's a very, very tough, tanky creature. And it's nearly impossible to kill with normal mortal means. Like, cannons would vir literally have virtually no effect on this thing. You need something much bigger than a cannon. Like, a rogue idol of G a great idol of Gork could do the job if it could get close enough. Though, between this thing's magic abilities, such as its ability to literally stare at you and turn your body to dust, um heal itself because it has a self-repairing mechanism or literally cause all of the desert around it to blast up into a windstorm which it uses as cover it's a pretty formidable opponent i have a feeling that tomb kings were pretty mean but then again uh i think that we will have something on this list that could uh face the Kevrick titan but anyway um we all obviously know that scarabs were sacred in the ancient Egypt. And, you know, it's not difficult to figure out that a huge construct shaped like one would be a cool idea for tomb kings. Uh, and even though actual Egyptians didn't ride enormous magic-fueled machines, let me tell you a bit of this and that about scarabs and the only trace of monster insects I know of present in the Egyptian mythology. So the reason dung beetles because like I said, this is what scarabs basically are, were so revered in ancient Egypt is because they supposedly embody the idea of cycle of life with that ship, you know? And because scarabs lay eggs in those poop bowls so that the larvae literally hatch into food because they eat shit. Uh, end of the wheel of life story. So Egyptians were amazed by how their dumps are the source of life and joy for another species. And they were amazed so much that they even depicted the god of creation and rebirth named Capri as a guy with a dung beetle for a head. Uh, now, the idea of rebirth assumes death at some point. So in the Book of the Dead, which is, by the way, an actual and great source of Egyptian mysticism, um, which describes the journey of a soul after it leaves the body, uh, so scarabs are also present in this book and in the afterlife journey, but in that gargantuan and much less friendly version. Uh, and the book actually contains spells and words to be placed upon the dead one to protect their soul from encountering such a charming critter on its way. 
And that's pretty much it. So this time we're slicing the list. It was so... my idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was Sodex's evil idea. So we're saying goodbye for now, and we will see you guys in a moment. Real hopefully. quick, do you think if Kimberly mm -hmm. Titans held on to their dung nature, that they could all, like, could you imagine if we made an idol of Gork, but used the Titan to make it? <laughs> oh my god, with the pyramid-sized uh, dung bowl. <laughs> that would That's... work, right? <laughs> Honestly... If that was if that was the case, the poop bowl would probably be the number one on our list of of monsters, monstrous monsters. You probably know? probably a good thing it's a construct and not an actual giant beetle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, stay tuned for our top three and goodbye for now. Bye. Hey, real quick, I forgot to say this in the initial video, so I'm just tacking this on to the end. Uh, if you want to catch part two of this episode, which has the three largest kaiju-esque monsters in Warhammer Fantasy, be sure to pop over to Lady Turn's channel, or Anna's channel, over at That Evil Hag. I will have a link to that in the top comment, pinned comment below, as well as the description. Thanks guys, bye.